John chapter number one, if you will. We're going to be back in verse 14 tonight. And um, we're going to, uh, we kind of park in this verse uh, this week and, and next week again. Um, as we come to John 1 verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, we talked last time there about the Word was made flesh, uh, the, the God-man, his, his humanity, uh, where God, 100% deity, added to his deity 100% humanity. So we, talk, we talked and we looked at the verses uh, last time about how he took on the nature, human, humani human, humanity's nature. He did not take on the sin nature. He took on Adam's nature pre-fall, not his nature post-fall. So when you think about his humanity, just kind of don't not think about his humanity because you're worried about not focusing too much on it, but think about them both together. And really we saw a lot of that in Luke when we studied the God, our, our study through Luke. Verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, this verse now is going to describe the next section in the verse here, what he did when he took on humanity. When the Word was made flesh, what did he do? Well, he dwelt among us. And then he manifested some glory, and he manifested some stuff about being full of grace and truth. So, He's going to do some things now in the verse. But first it says that he dwelt among us. When, when he talks there about dwelling, um, if you hold your passage here and run real quick to 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 1, the verse says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You see that thing there about this earthly house of this tabernacle? When he dwells with us, literally what he did was he pitched a tent and he pitched a, a, a tabernacle. He made, a, he made a scenario to where now he could come and live with us. By the way, 2 Corinthians 5.1, the earthly house, this is a temporary tabernacle. Its design is to dissolve and for us to move the body of Christ to move then into the eternal, made without hands. Okay, so when the Lord, if you go back there to John 1, when he dwelt among us, he literally pitched his tent among us, if you think about it like that. But when he says here that he dwelt among us, there's some things that he's doing. If you will remember when we studied John 1, 1 and 2 and 3. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him... You ever have that feeling that you forgot to do something? All right, I didn't. That's okay, because we would be screaming about no YouTube video. <laughs> Cause, all right, verse... What, Two, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. When, when we talked about those three verses, we talked about it back in eternity past, the word, the proclaimer of the program, uh, of God's, of the Father's program and plan about creation. Then he went and created and did it. Well, when he did that, verse 14 is telling us, the Word was made flesh, and He did something. He dwelt among us. Now, come back to Exodus chapter 25. Because when He pitches His tent, He's, he's literally coming to live among... And, and by the way, dwelt among us. He's not talking about the body of Christ. So when I say we or us, I'm talking about Israel. Okay? And I don't, hope I wouldn't have to say that, but... Sometimes you have to be that, just that simplistically clear about it. And in Exodus 25, Israel had a tent, had a tabernacle, where God had, was going to come and dwell amongst them. 
Exodus 25, if you will look at verse number 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Now, if you write down Hebrews 8, verse number 5, in Hebrews, it says that Moses was given the pattern of, for the tabernacle here after the heavenly tabernacle. So what Moses is making here for Israel and what Israel is doing is they're making not, not a big, you know, the big one, but they're making a miniature scaled down picture of the tabernacle. And the purpose of the tabernacle is what? Is verse 8, that I may come and what? Dwell with them. And literally, by the way, if you take that tabernacle and you lay that thing out, it literally is the pattern of the universe that God has created. And the reason he created, 1 John 1, 3, and he made all things, was to come and dwell with them. And to dwell with the creation. Now, the tabernacle is made here. By the way, what is it predominantly made out of? What are all its curtains made out of? Skins. Animal skins. So literally, he's going to put his glory in a building made out of skins. You're in Exodus 25. Come over to Exodus 40. Exodus 40. The building is done. The tabernacle is finished. It's completed. Matthew 4, or I'm sorry, Exodus 40, verse 33. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The cloud comes in, and what does it do? It fills up the tabernacle, but what does it fill up the tabernacle with? The glory of the Lord. Now, the glory here, that is that manifestation of the presence of Jehovah in Israel's presence. We call that the Shekinah glory. You'll hear that term used by people. And basically what it is, by the way, it's interesting to me, it's a cloud. What led Israel around in the wilderness? A cloud by day and a fiery um, a pillar of fire, thank you, at night. Well, what was that? That was God dwelling with... What was God's original intent in creation? It was to make the, this universe, this creation... Remember our studies on the Sabbath, the Sabbath day? And we're to rest on the Sabbath day. Why were we to rest? Why were they to rest on the Sabbath day? So that they would not have a day off, even though it ends up being a day off. It was so that they would contemplate and reflect and remember what creation, what God was doing in creation for the nation of Israel all the time, regardless of where they're at. Okay, we're to stop, we're to think about because on the seventh day God finished his work on the sixth day, and the seventh day he rested. His plan was the next Sabbath to come back and to do what? Dwell with the creation. In the midst of the week there, Adam falls. Adam and Eve fall. It all sick. Now, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Here He comes to do what? To fulfill a piece of what He originally created in creation to do, which was to come and to live with and among his creation. So when you come over to come over to First Kings eight, this cloud. The cloud, by the way, was proof that Jehovah was in the tent. He was there. He's in the tabernacle. Because the glory of the Lord dwelt in the tabernacle now. Now later on you have Solomon here, first Kings eight, and Solomon is has the wonderful privilege of building the temple. David wanted to build it. He looked at Nathan and said, Nathan, I, I have all of this, and the Lord's down there in a 4x4 four four tent trailer. We need to get him a house, and we need to do this. 
and Nathan said it's not for you to build it. But here are the blueprints, just like he gave Moses the blueprint. Here's the blueprint. What you're going to do, David, is you're going to go out and get all the stuff together. We've got the new board. I'll, you know how you have an epiphany in the middle of the night, it's 2 a.m., and you sit up in bed going, oh, I had one about the board. We were going to redo, put this on it. I'm, I'm saying, no, 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 no. That's got a cork thing across the top of it. We can hang stuff and do different things with that. We just got to get it up. And I was like all excited. And Linda's like, would you please lay back down? You're talking in your sleep again. I'm, I was all excited, you know. So I told Andrea, don't me tell James, don't mess with the board yet till we talk, you know. But the thing is, is David, here's the blueprint. You go out and get all the stuff together because your son's going to build it for me. You're not going to build it for me. The reason he does that with David, by the way, is David is a bloody man. He's a man of war. It's not his, that's not for him to do. Solomon, for Solomon in, his, in the second coming, a type of the second coming of the Lord, is to bring in all the glory and to bring in all of the wisdom and so forth. So you got a passage like this in 1 Kings 8, verse number 10. And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. So when the cloud is there, it's proof that the glory of the Lord is in the, is in the, is in the tabernacle. By the way, the tabernacle, here in 1 Kings it's the temple. The tabernacle, we'll see this in, a, in some future studies, is a picture of the first coming of Christ in his incarnation. Here it is. In skin and bone and we can move and we can do different things with it. The temple, though, is a picture of his second coming but his second coming into his kingdom when it's permanently established, it is not, it, it, it's made of brick and mortar now. It can't be moved around. It's done. So when you think about the tabernacle and the temple, same building uh, shape-wise, just different issues going on. Come over with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter number 40. So when we, t when the, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's accomplishing some things. Isaiah 40, verse number 21. Isaiah 40, verse 21. By the way, that temple and the, ta the tabernacle and the temple thing is going to be a great picture of God's ultimate program and plan for man. There they are. His first coming, his second coming, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, and he lays it out. Isaiah 40, verse number 21. Have ye, and the ye here is the nation of Israel, Israel as a whole, have ye not known, have ye not heard, hath it not been told you from the beginning, have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? Now the questions, the answer to every one of those questions is yes. They did know, they did hear, they were told, they did understand that everything that happened in creation was designed for, it was God's program that he, what he was going to do in creation with the nation and for the nation of Israel. They, and by the way, this is much more than just Genesis 1, 2, 3, the first 6, 7, 8 chapters of Genesis. They, when Moses writes Genesis, he has Job on the table with him. Job 38, 39, 40, 41, 37, 36, 35, all those passages in Job concerning the creation. You want to know more about creation, uh, it's not a waste of time, but don't waste time in Genesis. Get over in Job and in the Psalms. and I mean, you get over in Psalms 132, you get over in Psalm 68, you get all these Psalms that lay out stuff about creation. And when you do that, then... That's where they knew. That's how they heard. That's how they understand. Man, when he asked Job, where were you when I laid the beams in the water? Job wasn't even there. Wasn't even a bad thought. Mom and dad hadn't even been a bad thought. But what did Job begin to understand? 
He's the creator. He did it. He had a plan. He had a purpose. They understood God had a plan in what he was doing in creation. Now watch verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. This passage and the one, I think it's over in Amos, about the compass of the earth are two passages that Christopher Columbus understood and come to realize that the earth was a circle and not a drop off the off the horizon out there. Now, we know differently now, but these verses, Christopher Columbus, by some accounts, it was a Bible believer. He understood it, he read it, he studied it, and off he went. Now, it doesn't mean he was a practicing Bible believer, but he, he understood what was going on. Verse 22, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. Now, you think about that. He, he's the one that sitteth on the, upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants are what? Grasshoppers. Who's the big deal here? Him or the inhabitants? He is. He is the one that sits at the head of the government. He is the one. And, and the inhabitants of the earth are as grasshoppers that stretch, out, uh, that stretch out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to what? To dwell in. It, it, that the inhabitants are as grasshoppers. Go back up and look at verse 15. Isaiah 40, verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. 17. All nations before him are as nothing. You see, the nations aren't the issue. Actually, Israel in this passage isn't even the issue. What's the issue here? The issue here is that the Creator sits at the head of the creation, and His goal was to come and to do what verse 22 says, to dwell in the creation with them. He sets up curtains, stretched out the heavens as a curtain, you know, it's interesting. What do curtains do? They divide up, don't they? You and I, in the earth, we have an ozone layer that goes around the earth. That's why the sky is blue. If we didn't have the ozone layer, what would happen to us? We'd fry like bacon in the pan. But what is, So we have that ozone layer to do what? To protect us. But it does, what does it do, though? It divides up. Did you guys see the moon the other morning? The hunter's moon, the big moon? Well, you can see that. It's night. It's over. But during the day, have you see, ever seen the moon all day long? I have. It's, it's, just, it's very interesting. How, why is the moon still there? It's high noon, you know? Now, you can't sit there and see the pot marks like you could the other night when it's so big and bright. But you can still you see the shape there. The curtains, they divide up things so you can't see beyond. In describing the third heaven, he talks about it being a frozen, molten, frozen, you know, layer. It's interesting when you, when you look at that. But then in 22, he says, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in them. God gave to Israel a tabernacle, a tent, a picture of... His ultimate intent for the universe, you can lay it out, and, and we've done that in our studies here, um, with, in, in our Israel studies, I know, where you take the universe, and you take, you take Genesis 1, and you can take the tabernacle, and Exodus, and you can lay it out, and it lays right out side by side. And you begin to see the structure and what's happening with it. And when you do, what's the design? Verse 22. So he can come and dwell with them and in creation. Come over to Psalms 132. I said that just a minute ago. We'll go look at it. So in John 1, <clears throat> uh, find in John 1, 1, 2, and 3, where the Word was made flesh, I'm, I'm sorry, where the Word was with God and the Word was God, and he made all things, now... In 114, 
what the Word is going to do is He's going to do exactly what God had intended to do originally in, a, in, a, in the creation. And that is to come and dwell in it. So Jesus Christ, the ultimate manifestation, the Word, the one that speaks, He's executing the plan. He's coming now to accomplish the plan in creation the Father's plan in creation. Now, Psalms 132 is a psalm about the Davidic covenant. And next week we're going to talk about the grace and truth issue. And we're going to look at some things in that. And the Davidic covenant comes into play. Uh, by the way, the grace and truth issue is the new covenant. We're going to go look back over and look at some of that. Um, not a, a, in some detail, but then because when we get down in 117, we're going to spend more detail, okay? Verse, uh, chapter uh, 132, verse 1. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. So, again, everything now he's going to accomplish, is, is, that's going to be accomplished in David. By the way, Matthew 1, verse 1. Here's the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's the son of David all the way up to... He goes to Calvary, and at Calvary he becomes the son of Abraham, so he can bring in the blessing and bring in the redemption and so forth. But up to David, he's the king. Here he is. Drop down, if you will, to verse number 8. Arise, O Lord, arise, O Lord, into thy rest, and thou in the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant, my testimonies, that I shall teach them, their children shall sit upon their throne forevermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Now it's interesting in verse 14 when he says, Here, this, here, this is my rest. It's where? In Zion. Now Zion is in Jerusalem on the earth. This isn't the heavenly Zion. This is the Zion design down here. This is the place that David longed to be in and to go to. God had a place in the universe where he was going to come and live in it. And when he made the universe, he made a place on the peanut of a planet called Earth. And his intentions was to come and live and dwell there. Now when you think about the vastness of the universe and how big it is, and it's huge. And you think about how little and significant the third rock from the sun really is in that. Yet God's intention in creation was for that little rock to be the center of everything. Of the whole universe. There's great discussion about what it, is the sun the center of the universe. Does the earth go around the sun or does the sun go around the earth? And you get all this stuff back and forth and... They get to talking scientific stuff that I think they're making up half the words as they go. But, you know, what? well, in Scripture, what is the center of the universe? The earth is. And on the earth, specifically, it's going to be Zion, the Middle East over there. And we're talking about Jerusalem. So when he comes, and the flesh was made, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, he comes to accomplish this he comes to be where he's supposed to be now come over to revelation 21 because in revelation 21 we move obviously to the future but really it's eternity future this is past the millennial kingdom this is past the great white throne judgment Verse 1, 21, 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. 
And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's the first time where the tabernacle of God is with men in a condition back to original Genesis 1-1 state. In Exodus, he's with them, isn't it? The cloud moves in, the glory of the Lord is there. But is he really there? Well, his manifestation is in the glory and in the cloud, but he's in there in a temporary condition. And in Ezekiel, in three steps, he's gone. He leaves. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when the when the uh, the gospels there, when the the veil is rent, and they look behind the curtain, and guess what? They just see the piece of furniture there. He's gone. The tabernacle of God is with men. Now he's dwelling with them. Everything is accomplished here. By the way, it's a new heaven and a new earth, and all the plan is accomplished he is now dwelling with his creation and that is ultimately the goal and that's why when you come back to john 1 verse 14 the word was made flesh and dwelt among us he came to accomplish the ultimate intention of god in his creation and that was for God, the Godhead manifested in the Word, the one that's going to speak it, the one that's going to, going to manifest it, make it known, was to come and dwell among men. And you know what? There he is. He's here. Now, the parentheses is very interesting. Because when you just, just read the verse... Don't look, close your eyes, and just listen to the verse be read. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's pretty good, isn't it? Okay? Now, when you look at the verse, what do you see? You see the parentheses. Now, if you pull out the parentheses and don't read the parentheses, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. That's pretty good too, isn't it? But when when he dwelt among us, he was full of grace and truth. But the parentheses add in some things here. And it's that glory issue. Now, when you talk about the glory issue, it, you, you, you got to kind of pay attention to it because it, it, there's two issues going on here. One in the parentheses and one in the full of grace and truth. The full of grace and truth, that is an issue of the moral glory. That's his character. That's his person, who he is. He's what? Full of grace and truth. When then you read the parentheses, which says, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, what we're reading there now is a manifestation of his glory, but his official glory. So now we're talking about his office that he came to fill for the nation of Israel, which is their Messiah. Ultimately, he ends up being their prophet, priest, and king. But the point here is that these two issues, and, and you need to grasp them, because they are different issues, but they are very well connected <laughs> to each other. So when you talk about his glory, again, in the parentheses, we're talking about his official glory who, uh, of his office. And then when we talk about full of grace and truth, that's who he is. Now, come over to Ephesians 1, because when you talk about glory, you've you got to read Ephesians 1. When you talk about the issue of the glory of God, again, first of all, you're talking about all that God is, his character, his essence. 
but you're also talking about how he manifests his character and essence. And you know what he does? He does it according to the purpose and the plan of God the Father. That's how he does it. Ephesians 1, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory, of, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power, and so off you go. Okay? But notice here, he's the father of glory. This is a reference to the plan that the Father has to glorify himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to see that, just look across the page at verse number 10. Because in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together and one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. He has this plan, verse 9 calls it the will of the Father, and the will of the Father is to place Christ back at the headship of the universe, sitting on the circle of the earth, sitting where he's supposed to be. And the Father says, that's my plan, and you know what we're going to call it? We're going to call it glory. Because it's not only going to manifest who he is, but it's going to manifest also the 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 uh, the character in the person, and it's going to show us how how is he going to do this? How is he going to display glory? Well, if you flip the page, well, verse ten, real quick, he's going to do it through Israel on the earth, and he's going to do it through the body of Christ in the heavenly places. Now, John has no clue about you and I. He's worried about who? Israel on the earth. He's worried about, back in John 1, he's worried about verse number 12. Remember, we spent that time in 11 and 12. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become. Where he in, in John 1, he's beginning to set up that issue of, hey, here's the stuff that gets that nation. I, I, that verse over in Matthew where he, he looks at those Pharisees, and he says, I'm going to take it from you, and I'm going to give it to a nation bearing the fruit i'm not you know, that and john says okay remember i told you john starts where where matthew mark and luke conclude they conclude that his own received him not john starts there and says okay now here's how he developed that nation he's going to give it all to and he does it through the new covenant and he does it not by making them sons of God here, he does it through a process of teaching and learning and, 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 and uh, an edification process through here so that at the end, those who endure to the end shall be saved, at the end he can say, there's my nation that's going to display my glory in the earth. Look at chapter 2 of Ephesians and verse 7. This is an interesting verse for you and I that in the ages to come. Now, we use that on our board, ages to come. But ages is plural, isn't it? More than one. It doesn't say age to come. By the way, that's why... The, I don't know if you ever thought about why John looks at them in Matthew 3 and says, who warned you from the wrath to come? Matthew, he'll say you can blaspheme the Holy... Don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It won't be forgiven you in this world or that which is to come. Paul says, we're going to do this for ages. What are we going to do? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his glory and his kindness towards us through grace. What's he going to do with us? He's made us sit in heavenly places. He's going to use us for the ages to come out there to do what? To show, to manifest his glory. His plan, originally in creation, was to come and dwell with the creation, to share his life with them. Uh, come over to John 17. You've you, you got to see this issue here. He, the original plan was to come and to show 
and to dwell among them. John 17 and verse number 3. John 17, 3. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they may, might know thee, the only true God and, G, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. What is eternal life there? Eternal life isn't living forever. What is eternal life there? That they may know thee, not knowing someone. That they might know the Father, understand who he is and what he's planning on doing. What was he planning on doing in creation originally? Coming down and dwelling with creation and manifesting his glory and, and his grace and truth in creation at the, at the right time. Problem is, as man fell, sin entered the world, he held that back and said, okay, we're gonna, now we're going to go through and we're going to operate with a nation on the earth, and I'm going to keep a secret up here about a heavenly agency. By the way, you are, we are never called a nation, you know that? Closest thing you get to it is kingdom, and that's in a reference to government. We're a, we, we are a body, that's what we are, okay? A nation on the earth, we're going to reveal that, we're going to lay it out, but this other we're going to keep a secret and we're not going to talk about it. So what does John say? You know what eternal life is, folks? It's knowing who he is and knowing his plan and what he's planning on doing. Now, to know someone is to know them deeply. It's to know them so well that for them to just say something, you know instantly what they're doing and what they're talking about. That is what godliness is really all about. I've been looking at godliness in Timothy and Titus in the pastoral epistles, and when he talks about godliness, he's talking about the being able to understand what God is doing so you can then go and labor with him in it. So you, you got his plan, right? But it's more than just getting his plan now it's getting excited about his plan. Jeremiah 9, verse 24, he talks over there about them delighting in doing it. You know what? Let's go look at it. <laughs> Jeremiah 9, 24. This is what sonship really ultimately is all about. Jeremiah 9, verse 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this. All right, so we got a little glory going on here. That he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I what delight, saith the Lord. What is the what is the word? What does the Lord delight in? Love being able to exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness where? In the earth. Now, this is Israel's program, but think about it. Kind of, this applies to you and I. What is he doing in the earth? He's executing justice, isn't he? He says, hey, you're my nation. You know what, you guys, if you want to glory, glory and understanding and knowing me. That's what eternity, eternal life is all about. Know me, and then go out there and do what I delight in. Come rejoice in that. Well, he says over there, the, the zeal of the Lord hath eaten me up. <laughs> it's consumed me with what excites God. You know what Paul says? Paul says it in Philippians. Over there he says, that I may know him and be conformed to, the, to his death and his image that I may be compelled. I glory in the cross, and the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. He looks at Timothy and says, man, go do the work of an evangelist. Get out there and preach and teach and hold the sound doctrine. Why? Because what's God doing today? He would have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's getting excited. That's God-likeness. Knowing and understanding what God's planning on doing and getting excited about that and then you're going and you're doing it, and you're not really even thinking about it. And that's the sonship aspect to all of that.
Because a son will understand what the father's doing and then make the free will choice to do what? Go do it and be excited about it as well. When Ricky, my son, got his job, he asked me, he goes, what, what, what does it take to be a bus driver? And I said, you'll never be a bus driver. Don't do it. Go to school, get an education, be a lawyer, pay for your dad's retirement. Okay? Don't be a bus driver. Stay away. He's like, okay, I got that. When I lo- talked to my dad when I was younger <laughs> about being a preacher, you know what he told me to do? Don't do it. Stay away. It's a poor man's game. Don't do it. Don't do it. Never pushed to do. Why? Because if you're going to do it, you have to have a desire. You've got to have a zeal. You've got to have a want to do that. He told me, go be a garbage truck driver. I'm like, no, I don't want to be that. Then I found out how much they make, and now I wish I was one, you know. <laughs> they, make, they make good money, yeah. But the point here is, is what does the son do? The son says, there's what the father wants done, and I'm just going to go do it without him asking me to go do it. That's sonship. That's adultness. That's being an adult in the family of God saying, you know what? We understand the program and the plan of the Father. We're just going to go do it without him having to beg us to do it. And you know what we're going to do? It. We're going to do it excitingly. We're going to rejoice in it. We're going to glory in it. So come back to first, or John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. The little flock, the believing remnant, The Father had a plan of glory, and that was to glorify himself in Christ, and they saw it. They beheld it. If you hold here and come over to 1 John chapter number 1. By the way, how does the Godhead live? They live for one another. The Father lives for the Son. The Father lives for the Holy Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit lives for the Son. Holy Spirit lives for the Father. Son for the Holy Spirit, Son for the Father. They live for one another. Boy, you're talking about living, live a life like that for one another. That that phrase, one another, is all through Paul's epistle, laying stuff out. 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and with our hands have handled of the word of life. Boy, that's John 1, isn't it? For the life was manifested, and we have seen it. And bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. We beheld the glory of, We beheld His glory. The glory, we saw His glory. How did the Father make His glory manifested? Here's the Son. And we held Him. We touched Him. We handled Him. We, well, they didn't taste Him. They didn't eat on Him. But they tasted of His miracles. They, they They behold Him. They beheld Him. Now, when you behold something, uh, it's more than seeing it. You see me. Okay? But when you behold it, you take a careful, full, long look at it. You examine it. You spend some time getting to know it. You know? The other day I saw a car go by. I'd never seen it before. It just, boom, pretty good looking. It's like, I got to go see what that thing was. Problem is, the bus couldn't catch up to it. (laughs) You know, I mean, it got on the freeway and it was here, looked good, and there gone as a dot. So I was talking to one of the guys, and the guy goes, oh, that's the new Ferrari. I've seen it. Like, how'd you see it? He said, he goes, I'll sit next to it in the light. That's how I saw it. Well, the other day at the other yard, 
They're unloading. There's a shopper, a auto shop around the corner. They're unloading Magnum PI's Ferrari. And you know what I did? I went over and I beheld it. I didn't just go look at it. I went over and the guy's like, hey, how you doing? I said, great, I'm a bus driver. I just want to take a look. He goes, just don't touch it because I just wiped her down from the trip. And, I, and he was an auction deal and blah, 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 and back and forth. But you know what I did? I took a long drink, a long look at that thing. That was, boy, it was really nice. You know what they did? That's what they did. They looked at him. They, they handled him. They inspected him. They saw him dwelling among us. They saw him. We beheld his glory. Second Peter chapter 1. If you look at Second Peter 1. Again, they just didn't see him. They, I mean, they looked at him and they hold him up there and they examine it, you know, upside down and all. And I asked the guy if I could sit in that Ferrari. He goes, "You got a hundred thousand dollars?" I said, "No." He goes, "Then you, you, that's as close as you can get." And I said, "That's all." He goes, "Oh no, it went much more, but that's my bill." <laughs> I'm like, oh, "Okay." Second Peter one verse sixteen. Peter writing here, we have not followed cunning devised fables when we made known unto you the power of power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his what? Majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. Now watch, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. Notice that two glories there. Honor and glory, and then an excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now that's Matthew 17, the, their Mount Transfiguration. But what did they say? What does he, what's Peter say? We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him as the king. By the way, this passage is what helps you answer the end of Matthew 16 when he looks around there and says, there's some of you who aren't going to die who will see the king come in all his glory, in his kingdom glory, but yet they never saw him because they all died because of the interruption in the program. But Matthew 17, they go up the Mount, Tran the, blah, 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 the Mount of Transfiguration, and they see all that, but none of that's in Matthew 17. It takes 2 Peter 1 here to tell you what they saw when they looked at that event. See that? It's called a context, it's called a comparing scripture with some scripture. What did they see? They saw him in his kingdom glory. They saw him as king. Then John 1 verse 14 says, We beheld his glory. Oh, I was going to quote it now. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We saw the one who's come to speak the purpose and the plan of God. We saw him become flesh and do what the plan of God had in mind. He came and he dwelt among us. He was full of grace and truth. And all that God is, we saw him, he put it on public display. Everything he had planned from eternity past, right there. And then he says, he's the only begotten of the Father. When you talk about the only begotten of the Father, you're talking... He's the, he's the only one. There's no other. He's a unique one. You know, Abraham, in Genesis 22, it says... Take Isaac, thy only son. Well, Abraham had another son, but he only had one son from God, and that was Isaac. And Isaac is the seed, so you take him. John 3.16, he's the only begotten, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. By the way, the new Bibles pull that begotten out of there. Now, that's dangerous. 
makes for a multi-issue. We got a we have a God problem now. Okay, he's the that unique one, and that unique one is full of grace and truth. Now, come down to verse 17, and again, for time's sake, we're going to pick up on some of this next time, but I'll just get you to thinking about it. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So, verse 17 now begins to pick up with verse 14, which begins to pick up with verse 1-2. The proclamation here... Of the, he's talking about the manifestation of the plan of God. The law came by who? By Moses. That would be the old covenant. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about the new covenant. And what he came to do was make it all manifest, to bring it all to light. Now the law wasn't going to get the job done. Under the law, he couldn't dwell with them. Because they were, what is the law? By the law comes the knowledge of sin. They're sinners. You're sinners. You're guilty. You're guilty. He can't come, but under the new covenant, grace and truth, what can he do? He can come and dwell with them now. He can only dwell with them based on the new covenant, based upon what he's going to accomplish at Calvary for the nation of Israel. That's the only way he could do it. If he came underneath the law, now by the way, the right the law is a righteous thing. But the Mosaic law says you're guilty. You're guilty. It has that guilt complex. And but grace and truth shows up, the new covenant, and he says, Now I can come and dwell with you. Grace and truth. Truth is an interesting thing. Truth is the revelation of the of things the way they really are. That's truth. But gra grace <laughs> is that issue of all that God is free to do to, for you because of Calvary. Grace comes in and gives God that ability to work even though there's failure and evil to overcome. He can still come in and work. Grace allows truth to come in. Now, by the way, if it was only truth, you're in trouble. Because truth comes along and just manifests that this is the way this really is. Now, does that help or hinder? It hinders. You think about, think about the law. By the law comes the knowledge of sin. But think about the messianic law. The messianic law is even tougher than the old covenant law. You know how you know that? Matthew chapter number 5, what does the Lord say? Moses tells you if you do the deed, you're done. I'm telling you the Messianic law, if, if, if it's even in your heart and a thought, you've done the deed. Ooh, that intensifies the issue, doesn't it? Makes it a little bit tougher. So what do you need? You need, the, you need grace to come in and temper the moment. So grace, the grace of God comes in, and it begins to transform Israel into whom they gives them the power to become the sons of God. Now we'll pick up on all that next time because I want to run some verses about the new covenant and stuff with you. But when you think about 114, go back to John 114 so we can close. And we beheld uh, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When we looked at him, we beheld him. We, we looked at him, we examined him. And then he began to do things and accomplish things that demonstrated who he was. And that was Messiah dwelling among us. And his glory, the manifestation of who he is, the manifestation of his grace and truth, it manifested everything about who he really was. And he comes and he dwelt among us. He, the ultimate intention back there in eternity past was to come and live with his creation. Now you throw Paul's revelation in on that, and guess what? Now we know Ephesians 1.10 fits in, and we know how he gets the whole deal.
Jesus Christ came to dwell, to accomplish the plan of the Father, and without his coming, nothing would have been accomplished at all. That's why verse 14 is a critical, right here in the beginning, we're in the intro to the book. We're not even into the, we haven't even got into the issues yet. Which, by the way, the issues are coming with John the Baptist and the ministry and everything. We'll see all that. But right up front, John says, man, he came, he's accomplishing, he's doing. You want to know the Father, you got to get to know him. Live like the Godhead, live for one another. And oh, by the way, it's all going to be based on the new covenant information, grace and truth. Okay? We'll finish that up next time, I hope. (laughs) I would say if the creek doesn't rise, but the water's already leaked back there. So I think we're out of water in the leaking department. But we'll do that. So just kind of think about that grace and truth. Think about it in the lines of new covenant, because that's that's where we're pushing towards. By the way, the grace and truth issue, this is where people bring the gospel of John over into the body of Christ and say it's written really for us to, to consider and to look at. And, and it, he, John is really talking about us, the body of Christ. And uh, evidently they don't know how to read. But, that's, but they use that grace and truth, especially in verse 17, But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And they say, see, when he showed up, he introduces the body of Christ. He He introduces the doctrine for the body of Christ. But then he doesn't reveal who's going to be in the body of Christ until he comes and talks to Paul. That's what they say. It's like, really? Okay. (laughs) If that's the case, then why didn't the 12 apostles know and understand he was going to go die at Calvary? And, and that he was bringing in, why is it only in Paul's writings then do we have Paul's my gospel? And it's not found anywhere else but in those 13 books. And I just, anyway. Okay. All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the study, for the wonderful look into your son and who he is, what he means to and for the nation of Israel, and ultimately what he means to and for us and also the creation as a whole. We'll give you the praise and the glory for that. In your name we pray. Amen.